Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. You know, a lot of answers for us in the last few days. Also, but answers and new news brings more questions that may not be answered. And one of the big questions that we all have, of course, is will there be more arrests in the Kansas mom's case as the investigation proceeds? And of course, uh, the Kansas moms of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, as you see in this thumbnail on your screen right now. Some of the interesting things, of course, are right here, Miss Adams, Tiffany Adams, who seems to be uh, the kingpin, if you will, or the leader behind this sort of ragtag group of uh, conspirators, conspirators to commit murder, as we see them on the screen. We're with Tiffany Cole Twombly, Tad Cullum, and Cora Twombly. So much of the intentions and the evidence is mentioned in the arrest affidavit, the probable cause affidavit, which we'll, we'll talk about later on. But one of the big questions we all have is and are these four individuals. Are they the only ones involved in this or were there others? Of course, the media made a big thing about um, God's misfits, the anti-government group they apparently are uh, part of, these four. And who knows how many more people are involved in that. But did this organization, God's misfits, an anti-government group, have anything to do with this? conspiracy to commit murder. And it would seem, uh, the answer to that would be no, that this was a dispute. This was a uh, custody battle. Battle is the correct word. And the planning and the conspiracy to commit murder is, uh, it's screamed out from that arrest affidavit. And the people involved are very much co-conspirators. And all of them had done individual and collective actions that would bring them into this case, that would bring them in as conspirators, that to facilitate a crime, you must do something. They talk about the mens rea and the actus rea. Mens rea is the mental state of mind, right? Recklessly, intentionally, criminally, negligently, and knowingly. That's the culpable mental states, right? I'll say it again slower. Culpable mental states of mind to commit a crime. Recklessly, intentionally, criminally, negligently, and knowingly. Right? So that's the culpable states of mind. And the actus rea is to do an overt act that helps to facilitate the crime. I'm just trying to explain the law to you. And all of them both have the mens rea and the actus rea, the mental state of mind and the actus rea, which is doing something, an, an actual act to facilitate this crime. So we're gonna talk about this today, about the investigation. And is there anyone else involved or is this crime confined to these four individuals? We'll talk a little bit about the community and the effect that this crime has had on this small community. But till we do, hold on to your hats, get ready, you're entering true crime from a police perspective, and you're entering the off the cuff zone, the police off the cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have a car 
We still don't know who pulled the trigger. When we talk about potentially this investigation expanding and there being more arrests, there is a, an, an individual mentioned in the arrest affidavit, the probable cause affidavit, by the name of Paul Grice. And he was also mentioned by the 16-year-old daughter of the Twombly's, uh, Cora and Cole Twombly. People say I say that like I have a speech defect. Twombly, it's sort of <laughs> it's a, a little bit of a, a tough name to say. Anyway, um, the daughter mentioned Paul Grace, but apparently Paul Grace was brought in when the arrest occurred and he was released. Does that mean he can't be brought back in if they find more evidence of his complicity in that? No, absolutely. They could bring him back in, but for right now, Paul Grice is not in the trick bag. And I don't believe it's uh, some content creator reported that he was in the wind, that he took off. I don't believe that to be true. Uh, News Nation has reported on this. I'm going to play a little bit of their video in regards to this. And uh, Brian Enton has been boots on the ground. And has, so has a reporter named uh, Wu who's done a fantastic job of reporting on this case. So let me put this up on the screen and we will see what they say about this. Here we go. Senior News Nation correspondent Brian Enton has been crisscrossing the, the rural prairie from Kansas to Oklahoma and joins us now uh, from Oklahoma. Just before we get going, Brian, I just wanted to see if you can zoom out for a second. Because uh, I've spent time out in rural Oklahoma and rural Arkansas, Kansas. A lot of our viewers have not. And give us a sense of just sort of how vast and how rural where you are and where these crimes were. Yeah, I mean, look at this. It's, it's beautiful country out here. Western uh, Oklahoma, we're near Kansas, we're near Texas, we're near Colorado and New Mexico. All the states come together. It's, it's farmland, it's pasture as long as the eye can see. You've got grain, you've got beef, you've got pork. Likely some of the food you eat came from this part of the country. So it's beautiful, uh, which is one of the reasons this has just been such a barbaric murder and people here are so shocked. You mentioned that fifth person. His name is Paul Grice. Uh, he's also in the arrest affidavits. One of the suspect's daughters told police uh, that he was involved. And we have learned uh, through sources uh, that he was called in, uh, that he was taken into custody, that he was also questioned. Uh, but that he was let go, Leland. So Paul Grice uh, was let go. He has not been charged. Uh, why? We can't say for sure. It, it appears they don't have enough evidence. I mean, the suspect's daughter said he was involved, but once they got him uh, in custody and started questioning him, uh, there wasn't enough evidence, and, and he's out right now, Leland. Wow. It's such a wild story. And then you add in God's misfits and sort of the, the mystery of what, what other things these folks um, had planned. Brian, uh, phenomenal reporting on this story. As always, we're going to keep following it. We appreciate it. Thank you. So we don't know, again, uh, if you bring someone in, you're the police, you're the district attorney, you bring someone in on an investigation and you don't have enough evidence, you let them go. You can't hold someone if they didn't do the crime and you can't prove it, did they have probable cause when they brought him? I, I don't know. I don't know if he was brought in in handcuffs. I don't know how he was brought in. But if they did bring him in under probable cause and they felt that he was one of the conspirators here, they still uh, can release him if they if they feel that, uh, that he's innocent and he's not involved in this. Um, so much we found out uh, about this case and about uh, things that we did not know from the arrest affidavit. Um, and one of the, obviously, the interesting things was um, the premeditation that you discover, the premeditation that occurred in this case that is really very, very uh, 
out, you know, outstanding evidence uh, that shows the intentions of this group. I want to look at, uh, this is page two, and uh, the second paragraph where you see it starts with OSBI. OSBI, which stands for Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, interviewed Bruin. And if you remember, uh, Bruin was the, um, the, the woman who was the uh, supervisor, the custody, Cheryl Bruin. She was the custody supervisor. And uh, she said she was available to supervise the visit the day, uh, that day, but Adams told her to take a couple of weeks off from the visitation so Adams could question the children related to how Butler's approved visitation supervisors were. Butler and Kelly's phone records indicated their devices were actively sending signals to their carriers until approximately 0942 hours after which the devices were no longer seen by the networks and stopped transmitting. Neither phone was found at the scene or within the vehicle and they are currently missing. Adams was the last known person to communicate with Butler and was scheduled to meet Butler and Kelly for visitation at 10 o'clock on March 30th. Uh, through the child custody case, recordings were obtained where Rickman, of course, who is the baby's daddy here, discussed death threats by Adams and Adams' boyfriend, Tad Cullum. The custody battle began in February of 2019 with many hearings and court appearances. On March 18th and March 20th, 2024, motions were filed, requested extended visitation for Butler. And guys I'm, who are listening, I'm reading this right from the arrest affidavit. A hearing was scheduled to occur on April 17th, 2024. Butler's attorney informed OSBI that Butler was likely to receive unsupervised visitation with her children at that hearing. At times, Adams refused to let Rickman have his children, even though Rickman had legal custody of them. That's her son. Adams' son is Rickman. Law enforcement previously responded to a call for service where Adams refused to give Rickman his children. Reportedly, the officer told Rickman, Rickman he believed the children were better off in Adams' care. Rickman's grandmother, Debbie Knox Davis, reported that in mid to late February 2024, Rickman told her they didn't have to worry about the custody battle much longer because Adams had it under control, that Adams knew the path the judge walked to work, and we will take out Veronica at drop-off. Rickman was confirmed to be in a rehabilitation facility in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, at the time of the disappearance. The children remain in the custody of Adams. Rickman denied having that conversation with Knox. Um, interesting. Very interesting because the natural question we should all have right now, is Rickman involved in this? Is Rickman potentially going to be arrested later on? If he knew what Tiffany Adams was up to, if he knew he was about to kill if she was about to kill with her team of uh, three people and herself, that she was about to kill Veronica Butler and her supervised visitor, uh, is he involved also? That's something that we really need to question and to look into and part, as part of this investigation, of course, into the murder of these two beautiful women. Um, and all of this, all of these things, all of these questions uh, will be answered, will be answered during this investigation. And one of the things we spoke about yesterday was apparently upon arrest, Tiffany Adams confessed that she was the killer. So those are some of the things that we have not yet been apprised of. We know, of course, the manner of death in which I've, I've reported somewhat ad nauseum, as I say, I love that expression, that the manner of death is murder, it's a homicide, right? That was been that had been determined when the four the four co-conspirators were arrested. That was a foregone conclusion. Once they were arrested, they're up on the screen there. Once they were arrested, they obviously had probable cause. Tiffany Adams 
Cole Twombly, Tad Cullum, Cora Twombly. Once they were arrested and charged with first-degree murder, we knew that the manner of death was homicide, didn't we? Even though the medical examiner did not give the report of that yet. Um, so news, a news station, 3KSN, reported yesterday that when Tiffany Adams was arrested, she confessed to the murders. Anyone that's ever investigated homicides or any criminal case, a confession is the gold standard because what it does, it not only the person is admitting to what they did, but they're telling you how they did it. And you, the investigator, the detective, ma match up the confession to the evidence that you have. How would she know about a hammer on the scene? How would she know that Miss Kelly, one of the victims, right? Uh, Jillian Kelly had a pistol because, well, we found they recovered an empty magazine. Oh, not, not empty, excuse me. They discovered a magazine inside her purse. Could it be that she drew the gun and she wasn't quick enough and they killed her? before she could defend herself with her own pistol. Usually if you have a magazine, it's an indication, yes, you had a pistol too. But see, these are some of the questions, but in the confession, in the confession, Miss Adams, Tiffany Adams, would tell the police some of the things perhaps that they did not yet know. And her confession then, gets matched up to the evidence that they have, the evidence that they do know about. And that's why that is so powerful. That is such a powerful piece of evidence, a confession. And I, I'm Jeff Herndon. New developments in the case of the murdered Southwest Kansas mothers. Court documents reveal Tiffany Adams, the grandmother of Veronica Butler's children, admitted to killing Veronica and Jillian Kelly in the state's motion to hold Adams and the three other suspects without bond. Investigators wrote, after Adams was arrested, she, quote, made statements to law enforcement indicating she was responsible for the deaths of Butler and Kelly. The documents do not reveal what those statements entailed. Adams, Tad Colum, and Cole and Cora Twombly were in court for their first appearance today. They are each charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy, a judge denied all of them bond. It's something prosecutors pushed for. In court documents, they said, quote, now faced with the consequences of a sentence of death or life in prison, the defendants would be willing to do anything since they have shown to be willing to commit capital murder in order to limit Veronica's visitation. Prosecutors say there were many attempts made to take Veronica's life. Other court documents show the years of turmoil between Veronica and Tiffany, but efforts to secure a protection order did not get approved by a judge. Do you feel like the justice system failed? They 100 percent. Has it always been like this with Tiffany? In the last five years, 100 percent they have failed. What would you say to the justice system? They don't want to know. I don't have to get off your start. Well, the maximum sentence for murder is death, life or life without parole. Julia Thatcher asked the district attorney if the death penalty is on the table. He told her that will be decided later. Good. So you see that that was reported yesterday and uh, so many questions we ask now. Well, what, what did they get out of that confession? And when will they release that piece of evidence? They don't have to release that. I mean, perhaps a news station will file a freedom of information law for them to release that. But very, very interesting that... Uh, this confession uh, that Tiffany Adams confessed to this. Because, as I said, now she may have told them things that they didn't know. And now they match up that confession with the evidence that they have. And it's, it's just brilliant. It's a brilliant thing. Uh, 
Brenda Jean Finley from the chat. Hard to believe the grandma would confess they don't believe they are subject to the law. So why admit to a crime? You know, Brenda, sometimes, you know, people can um, can say how they would act if they were arrested, if they're in custody. But once you are involved in the criminal justice system and the reality, you have handcuffs on. Police come to your house with heavy weaponry and knock down the door and take you out forcibly out of your house. Sometimes people, believe it or not, have a need to confess. Is it the smartest thing to do for their case? No, but sometimes people actually have a need to confess. Uh, so yeah, it's it's powerful, very powerful. Uh, Pessa, uh, dude, the local police in that area and some judges may be corrupted. This trial will definitely be moved. Well, Pessa, I, I, I don't know for sure. This is a small community where apparently uh, everyone does know each other. In fact, it's been someone in the chat just said that, um, so someone in the chat said that uh, Cole Twombly's brother is running for sheriff. So you could see how everyone in this neighborhood, uh, in this area, of Oklahoma knows each other. Very small, a community of about 2,500. So yeah, would it be tough to get a jury uh, in a, uh, a town, an area like that, that, um, that, you know, that people could be fair? Or so, you know, we, we don't want to jump the gun, but could they potentially move this to another location because of those reasons? 100%, 100%. Uh, I want to also play um, a little bit of Brian Enton talking about uh, the grandmother, of course, T uh, Tiffany, in custody. And she, he's with um, Elizabeth Vargas. And we'll play a little bit of this. Brian Enton, as I said, has done an outstanding job on this case. Elizabeth, we know that uh, we've known that the mom. Yeah, Elizabeth, we know that uh, we've known that the moms were found in a rural area about eight and a half miles away from where the car was discovered. But this is the very first time that we are seeing video and images of when investigators showed up uh, out at the location and started digging and searching for the moms. And if you look closely, it's grainy. We were obtain able to obtain this video. It was taken from a, a ways away. So it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look closely, Elizabeth, you can see all of the police cars out there. Uh, the investigators are out there and there is also equipment that they had on site that they were using at that location as they began digging for uh, the bodies. Again, it's about eight and a half miles away from where the mom's car uh, was discovered. We have learned through sources that the bodies were found 10 feet uh, beneath the surface, that they had been covered with soil and they had to dig 10 feet down, located near uh, a dam, uh, and that hay in the area was used to then cover the soil so that no one would be able to notice uh, that they were digging in that area. We have also learned uh, that it was cell phone pings from the burner phones. Remember, the suspects had burner phones, uh, that it was the cell phone pings uh, that led them that, to that area. And that is why they, they focused in on that rural area, started digging there, and then 10 feet down uh, discovered the body. Right. Suspect. I was just going to ask you what led them to that location, how ironic it was the burner phones that Tiffany Adams, the grandmother of the two children who's charged with murder, the cell, the birth. What's totally amazing to me is the technology we have now, the track digital de devices. It's just the power of it. And many people said, oh, they'll never track these cell phones. This is too rural. There's no cell sites. There's no towers. There's no this. It won't ping. Look at this. They tracked it right to where they were burying the body. Unbelievable, right? And when people say, oh, they can't do it. You know, we spoke about the technology called geofencing, which is a technology where, and usually the FBI, because they have all the expensive toys that local law enforcement doesn't have. Geofencing can pull up 
any digital device in a geographical area at a geographical time. So if a killer is on his cell phone in the vicinity of a murder, they're going to identify that person. These people that were involved in this, the co-conspirators, were undoubtedly talking to each other using those burner phones, you know. The complaining witness, the 16-year-old daughter of Cora Twombly and Cole Twombly, he's the stepfather, she saw those burner phones charging on their dresser. I mean, talk about the technology and uh, and the evidence that this is, how how damning this evidence is. Pessa, Brian Koberger turned off his phone. You know, Pessa, that in itself also is damning evidence. Because if you're someone that always has their cell phone on and then you do something nefarious and all of a sudden your cell phone is turned off, that's evidence that could be used against you also. He turned it off because he knows that he could be tracked. And then after the dirty deed was done, what did he do? He turned his cell phone back on, didn't he, Pessa? Yup, and you have it right there. He turned it back on. So, look, circumstantial evidence from which inferences are drawn is extremely, extremely powerful evidence, especially, and I say I use my hands here, when it's piled up on top of each other. Not just one piece of circumstantial evidence, tons of it. And when you get all that circumstantial evidence and you pile it on top, that's why, you know, and if you just, I know you, it's off topic, but you mentioned Brian Koberger, the whole thing of him coming up with an alibi is absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense. And when the FBI digital expert gets up there and starts testifying about his cell site hits, and then they get some former FBI agent who's now an expert for some uh, ABC, his own company, testifying that, oh, no, that's not correct. Who do you think they're going to believe? They're going to believe the former FBI agent or the current FBI agent that is the resident expert. Let's go back to uh, Brian Koberger here. Burner phones that she herself purchased in the days uh, leading up to the murders. We're also hearing that there may be a fifth suspect, a fifth person who was part of God's misfits, who may be facing some sort of charges. Is that true? So no charges at this point at all, Elizabeth, but this has been one of the big sort of mysteries that continues to remain and that people are questioning in the community why this person has been charged, who this person is. It, the name is Paul Grice. Uh, he is named in the affidavit. He was questioned by police. So he was taken in. He was questioned. He was released. It appears that he knew something about what happened, exactly what uh, we don't know, but but he was released. And we've talked to people today, Elizabeth, who know him and his family and are saying, look, he's, he's a good man. Uh, and they are waiting to hold judgment. Uh, if he hasn't been arrested at this point, they say everyone should sort of just back off right now because rumors are flying like crazy out here. Yeah. Uh, but but he's not been arrested at this point, Elizabeth. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see where that goes. Brian, we've been hearing so much about the influence, the power, the sway that this uh, family of Tiffany Adams uh, had in this small community. I'm, I'm curious, in that town there, is there a lot of support? I know the victim's families are furious and were quite vocal about it and had to be restrained in court yesterday. But what about people who live in that area? Are they still afraid to speak out about these four murder suspects or are people starting to loosen up now? Uh, they're loosening up a little bit, but there's still a lot of, you know, intimidation. I mean, these suspects, some of them were very, very powerful. And if you look at that video again, the new exclusive video that we got, Elizabeth, uh, the person who na owns that land, his name is Jamie Beasley. And this, this is sort of a good example. Uh, Tad uh, Cullum, one of the suspects, uh, wealthy, has a lot of land. He leased some of the land from Jamie Beasley where the, the bodies were discovered, uh, the video that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and the thought is, you know, perhaps he leased this land from someone who doesn't have as much money, decided to go out and bury the bodies there. They have similar looking trucks, which is interesting. Was he sort of trying to frame Jamie Beasley? Is that a possibility? Uh, but so you've got people like, you know, Jamie Beasley who are say, who are intimidated. I mean, yeah. this guy had a lot of money, came out, leased some of his land. And now police show up, start digging, as you can see in the video. And that's where they discovered the bodies. All right. Brian Enton reporting live. From
So very interesting, right? Like why did they bury the bodies where they buried them on leased land so that Tad Cullum, uh, it wouldn't be tied to him, that he would tie it somehow to the person who he was leasing the land from, Mr. Beasley there. Yeah, so, you know, all of this stuff, of course, we come, here's Tad Cullum up on the screen right now, a wealthy man, right? You know, do not judge a book by its cover, you know? But, well, you know, you could be wealthy and still do horrific things, you know? Uh, but that's Tad Cullum you're looking at on the screen. Um, and so he buries the bodies on the land that he was leasing from a man named Beasley. But what they did, again, was the stupidity of people that have, well, even regular people that commit crimes all the time, they do stupid things too. But the cell phones were tracked right to that location. And the FBI and Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, they see land that was disturbed, a recent fresh dirt on top. So with the coordinates from the cell phone hits, that's where they dig. And that's where they recovered the bodies of our two victims, uh, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, at that location. Um, rest in peace. I like this um, little thumbnail better. Uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about these cases, it's sometimes easy to forget uh, that there are really, really victims here. Two victims on that screen with a, a devious, evil grandmother named Tiffany Adams there on the screen, you know. And the four co-conspirators, the three, the three, including Tiffany Michelle Adams, that, you know, days before this were known as fine citizens. No one thought, although apparently many people did fear Tiffany Adams and Todd, Tad Cullum. So power, you know. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, as they say, you know. So people in this area were uh, were very intimidated by these people. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, real crime stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. Ring that bell. Hit the like button. Share us with your friends. And your family. If you want to contribute to us, we have a Patreon with three different levels. We also have a YouTube channel membership with count them five different levels. And we appreciate all the support we get from our friends, our fans, our subscribers, and they make this show uh, what it is right now. Uh, S. Ray from the chat Adams has had Jones as her attorney throughout this custody battle, and Jones explains Adams' influence and stature in this community and the vigilante culture of this area. Fascinating. Wow. You know, I think this area also, uh, many of the people here, of course, any community uh, does not want this type of negative attention on their community. You know, uh, uh, Sharon Reynolds in the chat, my son makes and fits all technology data and intelligence for the government, like armed forces, drones, robots, much more proud mummy. Well, Congratulations, Sharon. That's something to be very proud of. Uh, uh, I Barbara, I never figured out if they lived at Keys or Ava. Some YouTuber was showing Texola photos. This is the area of Oklahoma, of course, you're speaking about. Um, Mama Bear from California. Six children are without their moms. This is just horrible. 100% this is horrible. I don't think that murder is ever not horrible. Maui Swift, good to see you, Maui. Community are probably relieved they are behind bars. You know, Maui, I think you're probably right. I think that these people probably, the, the grandmother seemed like she was a bit of a bully, you know, from what we could see of her, you know. Um, Lotus, 
Dollars doesn't equal intelligence. You're 100% correct. Uh, people prove that all the time, right? Uh, Mama Bear, California, I wonder how intimidating they will be in prison. Well, prison knocks people down to size, that's for sure. Uh, sour Girl from the chat. Four people threw away their lives. Throw away two women's lives and threw away those children's lives. Control your anger. Yeah, well, we know that um, we know that this was all about a custody dispute, you know, a custody dispute. Pessa from the chat. Small town corruption is common in northern New Mexico. Two of the last sheriffs in the country north of me are in jail. Federal crimes. Yeah, I mean, look, it's who's shining the light on these small towns? Who's in charge in these small towns? I mean, we've seen uh corruption across this country even in bigger towns look at south carolina right with uh murdoch alec murdoch if you guys followed that case an attorney and a family that controlled that town for over 100 years and now he's in prison for the rest of his life kills his wife and his son and embezzles 12 million dollars i mean just unbelievable susan wood cora told her daughter things didn't go as planned and the two women were dead. I wonder if Cora was told they were just going to scare the woman but not kill them in order to get Cora to go along. I think Cora knew exactly what was going on. Uh, I think she willingly took part in it because she so cavalierly said that uh, when her daughter asked, well, why did Kelly have to die? And she said, oh, she supported Veronica. So she had to go too. I mean, is someone not involved going to speak so cavalierly about murdering someone that was innocent in that way? I don't think so. I don't think so. So uh, total, totally horrific. And yes, was she involved? Cora was involved. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that Cora was involved. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to Brian Enton here so bear with me uh but this is the area where the missing women were found this is the spot you remember in the police report they mentioned uh, a dam this right here this this build up of dirt this is the dam there's a pond on the other side uh, and if you walk with me this way uh just about 50 feet or so maybe a little more from the dam you can see where the earth is disturbed where the tractors were out here this is where investigators came they dug right in this area went down about 10 feet i'm told uh, and this is where they discovered the missing mom's bodies. If you look in the distance there, uh, you can see there is a pile of hay back there. I am told by sources uh, that that hay was moved over the area where the digging happened, that Tad, the suspect Tad, moved that hay over here uh, to cover up the area where he was digging, hoping that the cows, this is a, you know, there's a cow farm here, that the cows would come over, this is a ranch, and start feeding on the hay and make the area look less suspicious. Uh, but still, investigators were led to this spot. And again, this is the area right here where they started digging and they found the bodies. Remote area, Ashley, very, very difficult to get to. Again, you go down the dirt road and then you have to walk all the way out there. There's really not much out here at all in any of these areas in Western Oklahoma, uh, but, but cattle land and ranches and, and windmills, by the way, if you see the blinking red lights behind me, if you're wondering what those are, those are the windmills. At night, they have these blinking red lights on them. I almost thought it was an airport at first. So nothing out here but windmills uh, and cows, Ashley. So tell me about the, the adjoining property to the property where the graves uh, were, were dug. Uh, the neighbor um, who lives adjacent actually saw what was going on, saw the police um, showing up with the, with the back hose. Tell me a little bit about the neighbor. Yeah, so the neighbor did uh, spot what was happening. I mean, when, you know, the convoy of, of state and local law enforcement moved in, obviously shocking to everyone. First of all, the property owner who owns and was leasing the, uh, the land to Tad Cullum uh, is shocked by all of this, had nothing to do with the murders, can't believe they found the bodies on, on his land. Uh, his neighbor, though, uh, is also just he knows everybody involved, like so many around here, knows all four suspects, knows both victims, knows all of their families, is upset about 
uh, the rap that their community is getting nationwide because, you know, there's a lot of just good farmers and family people out here. This is what he told me. Did you know everyone involved? Yes. Wow. That puts, I mean, I, I, a lot of people here are in the same position, but that must just be emotionally it is. It's it's hard. tough. It's hard. It, it's very hard. And, you know, they all come from great families and, and their families are still great. They're brothers and sisters, mothers, uh, fathers. They're, they're all people that I've known all my life and think a lot of and still do. Uh, we can't let the acts of one reflect badly on everybody. You know, I, I think he would perhaps like to take back what he just said. You can't reflect on the acts of one. There was four people involved in, the, in this double murder. I mean, I think he sort of misspoke. He seems like a nice guy, but uh, yeah, you can judge the acts of four people, even if one was the trigger puller or however this cause of death we find out was. They were all involved in this. They were all conspirators. They're all arrested for murder in the first degree. They all may get the death penalty. We're not guilty by association. Was it shocking in particular with, with, with these folks having known them? Well, you know, it's not, it's not my place to pass judgment. Um, that's the judicial system's job, not mine. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to condemn or, or support. I'm just here to say that the people in this county are good people. Yeah. And we don't want this to reflect differently than, than what we really are. We're not cults and we're not misfits and we're just hardworking ranchers and farmers. And we, you know, odds are if you've eaten beef or you've eaten pork or you've eaten bread, odds are the people in this area had something to do with providing the products that made those, those uh, things that we all survive on. And uh, we're, we're not, um, we're not demons. We're just not. You know, Ashley, I've seen several grown men, ranchers, get tears in their eyes uh, over the last couple of days talking about this situation. Again, just because not only do they know all of the suspects, uh, but they also know the victims. They know the area where the bodies were found. They know the landowner. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, and it's just still a very, very emotional time. I'm sure that they're just all rocked by the notion that they may be painted with the same brush, which is just horrible to think of speaking of those who are out there and everyone knowing everyone thank you for watching so you could see that the obviously the community uh is is uh just devastated by this renee rosencrant from the chat i know cole tiffany and tad and they were all four in on it renee do you want to expound upon that you know as the uh brian enton just interviewed that gentleman right there this is really affecting the community there. People do not want to be painted with this broad brush that this is, uh, these people are, you know, in these uh, anti-government groups, God's misfits, that they're, uh, you know, supremacists, white supremacists, perhaps. Uh, it seemed like some of the national media were really interested in this story because of that angle that this uh, God's Misfits uh, group, this anti-government group, and it, it doesn't seem that that had anything to do with these murders. It also, when it was looked into, this group, God's Misfits, was not on the radar of the FBI. They were not in a... Uh, a group that was being watched by the FBI. They were not a group that uh, they knew anything about. So, uh, yeah, it's, but that's why, um, that's why they were uh, all interested, the, the national media. Uh, Daryl Hicks from the chat In life, you must control your emotions or ride the wild wind. Uh, good point. Uh, Mama Bear, California, where were the burner phones in the whole? No, the, the burner phones, uh, I, I, we don't, in fact, know if the burner phones were recovered by law enforcement. That's not been reported to us. We know that the victims' phones were never recovered, according to the, uh, 
the arrest affidavit. But we don't know if the, we, we would imagine that law enforcement did probably recover the burner phones, but they were able to find the bodies because of the GPS coordinates that they tracked to that very location and then found ground that was disturbed. And that's how they know it. Lotus in the chat. I guess since they were a big fish in a little pond, they thought they could get away with it all. I don't know what they were thinking uh, because obviously they didn't do well. They got, they left a lot of uh, evidence that law enforcement did track Esther from the chat, anger, bitterness, and hatred roots in the heart. Talk about a serious heart issue. Esther, you're hundred percent correct. Uh, uh, Renee Rosencrant, uh, Amy, thank you. I'm here on here to stop a lot. We're not all bad in this time. We're horrified by what happened. Renee, I, I wanted to call out to you, and I don't think anyone that watches, at least watches my show, Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories, we're not trying to paint this town with a broad brush. We just paint these four people as bad people. Uh, not the town, but when something like this happens in a small community, of course, it taints the entire town. Uh, Shelly, well, the community do do not need to fear them. Look how ignorant they carried out the crime. It's so sad what they did. These children, no moms ever again. Shelly, do you live in that town? I just want to ask you that question. Uh, Ann Chapman sounds suspicious. Uh do rich people, so LR333, do rich people get the death penalty? You know, the death penalty is a penalty that uh, is very difficult, um, that you can be sentenced to the death penalty after a trial if you're found guilty. But for the actual penalty to be carried out, sometimes can take 25 or 30 years because there's endless, endless amounts of appeals that uh, courts allow. And there's people sitting on death row, or, you know, for 25, 30 years. And then sometimes they, they don't get the death penalty. That's commuted to life without parole. What we've seen in New York City and New York State, which is horrific, is cop killers who were sentenced to life without parole are getting paroled. 30, 35 of them have recently gotten paroled. Cop killers that was supposed to do life without parole. That does not make anyone that ever worked as a police officer happy that they are releasing cop killers. Uh, Chastity Griffin, uh, ch plus knowing one person isn't arrested, Paul Grice, Grice, even scarier. Chastity, you know, Paul Grice was apparently taken in and released. So they didn't have the evidence against him. If as this uh, as this investigation proceeds, will they develop the evidence? There's potential that they could, but we don't know. Lotus from the chat, Lordy, I'm an RN who used to work at a hospital near a meat packing plant in Kansas. Boy, it made me never want to eat meat again. Hmm. Uh, Michelle from the chat, Michelia. It's not about the community. It's about the victims. Uh, yeah, you're 100% right. The victims, the victims' families, that's who this is about. Uh, Sharon J., there are about 100 members of this cult. It's time for IRS to step in. Um, Sharon, you know, unless an organization, you, you just called it a cult, um, unless they're committing crimes, they can't just dissolve them. You, as an American, as you have rights, you can get together with a group of people. You can call them, call your group whatever you want. But unless you're committing crimes with this group, they, no one can just make you disband. Renee Rosencrant, they were all friends, hung out together, worked together. Yes, they were all in. I have lived here five years. I knew nothing of the misfits. But I knew them as farmers, and they were all nice to me and my family. Renee, thank you uh, for uh, updating us on that. Uh, but it seems that what people in this area, uh, 
that were intimidated by these people, that were afraid of these people. One Law 214, these people remind me of a movie about a true story, Murder in Kuwait County, starring Johnny Cash and Andy Griffith. I have it on Roku. Well, this, this reminds people of, look, crimes happen all over this country. Uh, Marianne Birdie, have they recovered the murder weapon? Marianne, you know something? Good question. I don't know the answer to that, nor has law enforcement offered that up, uh, whether they do. As this case proceeds, we will find out more and more information. Uh, um, Sour girl, no one thinks this town is bad. Good Lord, peace be with all the innocent in that town. 100%. Uh, Amy Devine, I still can't believe Granny was able to talk so many into a double murder plot. Uh, yeah, that's it's hard to believe, right? How did she talk these people into doing this dirty deed, right? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, Kasaria uh, from the chat. Glenda Cox, this guy bugs me too. He won't pass judgment on his murderous neighbors, but we should all be grateful for the beef and pork he produces. What? Yeah, I think that gentleman uh, sort of misspoke. Uh, Kevin Callahan from the chat, uh, the news of saying the granny is rich, is that true? They're, they're saying that. They're saying uh, Tiffany Adams and her, her boyfriend, Tad Cullum, are wealthy landowners. That's what they were saying. Uh that was being reported by News Nation. Um, um, Ashra Vreeden from the chat. Hello from the Netherlands. Welcome from the Netherlands. A lot of people in this chat from all over. Uh, One Law 214, Granny meeting her Waterloo. Uh, Kirsten Kolb, thumbs up pressed. <laughs> uh, granny is a control freak. That may very well be that Granny's a control freak. Uh, you know, even, you know, uh, Brian Enton has um, has spoke numerous times being interviewed by different people on News Nation about the fifth, the fifth potential suspect. And that's the gentleman we've been talking about, Paul Grice. Here's a little interview he does, uh, Brian Enton does with uh, Chris Cuomo. And let's uh, let's see what he has to say here. that one of the suspect's daughters told police that Paul Grice was also involved in the murders. And our sources confirm that he was brought in for questioning. He was taken into custody. He was questioned, but then he was released. Apparently, there was not enough evidence uh, to hold him. We spoke to his landlord and former employer. This is what he had to say about Paul Grice. Did you know Paul Grace? Uh, yeah, I know of him, um, and uh, he has a young family, very nice guy. Uh, he's the kind of guy to come up, shake your hand, tell you hi, and any time I've been around him, he's he's just been out cleaning and working hard and taking care of cattle, and um, he seems to be a good guy. My understanding is that he was taken in and questioned, and apparently the OSBI and FBI didn't think it warranted arresting him, so I guess he... Uh, He's not in custody, so I have no reason to believe they had anything to do with it. So apparently not enough evidence uh, to hold Paul Grice, uh, Chris. We know that he's still in town. And just like that, uh, that man is landlord. There are a lot of people are standing by him saying, look, if he hasn't been arrested, uh, you know, we're not going to judge him at this point. It also means that the people they do have in custody didn't uh, include him, because if they did, that would have been enough to trigger an arrest. Uh, and they don't want to arrest somebody if they're not going to be able to hold them because you don't get that many bites of the apple. Uh, what have you learned also for us quickly about what they did with the bodies here and what it tells about their plan? Yeah, so we know that they took the bodies eight and a half miles away from where the car was discovered. We went out there. We got this exclusive video from someone in the area. Uh, they buried the bodies 10 feet underground, Chris. 
Uh, it's near a dam. Uh, and then they actually spread hay over the bodies. Uh, we're told the hope was that uh, the cows would come over into the area and disrupt the area and sort of make it less suspicious. Uh, but through the cell phone tracking, through the pings of the burner phones, that's how police were able to figure out that that was the spot they dug. They went down 10, uh, 10 feet and they discovered the two women. Brian Enton, as always, you are getting us more, you are getting deeper, and you are helping. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Hey. So that was, uh, that's the report from uh, Brian Enton. And, you know, people keep asking the question, Paul Grice, why did they let him go? How come he's not being arrested? Well, uh, they didn't have enough evidence. Does that mean he won't be brought back into this case down the road? No, he could still be, but we... They let him go. Uh, S. Ray from the chat. Um, yes, Adams is rich and very influential. How else could she hire a legendary defense attorney who was hired by the U.S. federal government to defend Timothy McVeigh of Oklahoma City? Well, yeah, if she hires an attorney, she must have money because, as we all know, attorneys cost lots of money to hire. Uh Marjorie Manning, Cora was a neighbor up here in Nebraska, and this isn't the woman I knew. Yeah, but uh, her own daughter is giving evidence against her. Uh, Stan the Man, new viewer from CNY here. Thank you, sir, for your service, Bill. Very intriguing case you were covering. Thank you so much, Stan the Man. Very much appreciated. You know, guys, this case is um, is, is quite interesting, you know. Uh, a group of people get together and they agree to destroy their lives to help Tiffany Adams kill basically her daughter-in-law, her daughter -in -law, the mother of her grandchildren. And they get together, they plan it, right? They do things to facilitate this crime. And now they're facing the death penalty, or at the very least, life without parole. Will any of the four potentially get a deal? Will any of them not get sentenced to this and cut a deal to testify against the others? That all depends on how strong of a case, uh, how strong of a case the government has against these people, or weaker case, and will they need to cut one of these faces you see on the screen? Obviously, Tiffany is not getting cut any deal. She is, according to the news, a confessed, the confessed killer. Cole, Cora Twombly, Tad, Bert Cullum. Will any of them be cut a deal by the government? I don't know. I don't know if that's... Uh, the case could be so strong that the government may not need uh, to cut any kind of deal. And But we also have to remember that these are the two victims, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, and we never want to forget that these are the parties that lost their lives in this horrific case. And when we go over the interesting and all the uh, evidence and the thing that draws people to true crime into these cases, we must never forget the victims, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. Folks, that's going to be our show for today. And if I come up with any, if any new information comes out, we'll be all over this case. It is quite interesting. The people in this town are not guilty of anything. Those four conspirators are, and I want everyone to remember that. And I want to also thank everyone for tuning in today. This is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon. Have a great day, everyone, and God bless. One episode, just ain't enough.